Is it important to address or manage the stories that other people have about us? Is it even possible to change the stories others have about us? Welcome back to Love Your Story Interview Land. Today, I bring to you Emily Chipman, a woman and executive coach that I first met in one of my Love Your Story launch pad workshops. She stood out to me because her additions to the conversation we were having were so insightful and spot on that I knew this woman had some great experience and real talent for coaching people. Emily is an executive coach with Russman Consulting, working inside businesses and with business professionals to instigate leader and team behavioral change. Her mission is to make life better for both the leaders and those that she works with. And frankly, she is truly engaging, uplifting, focused, and exceptional at what she does. I'd like to also let you know that while many people can call themselves life coaches, and many people do, Emily is actually accredited and trained as a coach. She is accredited by the International Coaching Federation and is one of a select number of coaches in the world certified to use the top behavioral coaching method, the Marshall Goldsmith Stakeholder Centered Coaching which she does use with businesses all over the country. So stay tuned because we are talking about something that we haven't talked about before. We're talking about the idea of how we can manage the stories that others have about us. This is new ground and I'm excited to get into the discussion on how to do it. Stories are our lives in language. Welcome to the Love Your Story podcast. I'm Lori Lee. And I'm excited for our future together of telling stories, evaluating our own stories, and lifting ourselves and others to greater places because of our control over our stories. This podcast is about empowerment and giving you, the listener, ideas to work with in making your stories work for you. Story power serves you best when you know how to use it. Emily, welcome to the Love Your Story podcast. Hello. It's good to have you here. Thank you. It's good. It's great to be here. You work with many other aspects than just story as you coach at an executive level. But as we talked, it's clear that you truly understand the huge role that story plays in the success of individuals and businesses and how they function. So can we start this out with a conversation and with you discussing your understanding of story and its role with the people that you work with. Yeah, I, I would just start by saying in business, stories are prevalent from the very moment that you take a job to the very end. And so anybody that I work with really is, is always dealing both with the opportunity to grow, but also working to change the perceptions that other people have of them, which is really difficult sometimes and sometimes it's easier and you you do see those stories coming out like I said from beginning to end so people who do interviews when they answer interview questions with stories interviewers remember them better you hear about leaders trying to share their strategy by coming up with a compelling story sales it's about how someone makes you feel which goes back oftentimes to a story conflict how people manage conflict often has to do with the stories that they have about other people and other people have about them. And even when they're leaving the business, how are you going to leave people remembering you? What are the stories that they're going to remember to tell when they're called with a reference? So really pretty much every aspect of your work is going to go back to a story. Right. It's pretty prevalent. And we (laughs) we talk about that prevalent aspect of story all the time. In fact, I just had a guy email me the other day and he said, you know, help me with this. I'm trying to do a sales letter and I know it's going to be better if I have a story in the introduction. What does this look like? And another woman emailed me and said, I'm putting together an online training um, series for, you know, for a great big company and I need stories to be able to teach each of these principles. So across the board, we're using it all the time. And as you and I talked we talked about this aspect of managing the stories that others have about us. And you're the first person that I've spoken with that really has a down pat way of doing this. And it's a brand new concept. We haven't talked about it before. I hadn't even thought too much about it before. So I'm excited for you to to share this idea. Is it important to manage and address the stories that others have about us and why? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say absolutely yes. And then I'm going to turn the other way, so to speak, and say that I recognize there are people listening who will say, hey, you shouldn't adopt other people's stories as a measure of your worth. You need to know who you are. So I'm going to say, absolutely, you need to know who you are. And also, when you're in business, you're always dealing with stories. So how do we do that? You know, the story comes to mind of a of a gentleman who had a really terrible reputation. People did not want to work with him. And my mentor who was working with him came in and he basically walked him through the steps that you would need to do to change your others' perceptions of you. And to be honest, it starts with coming with an honest, humble acknowledgement that there's a problem, a perception problem or a behavior problem, which can be very real. Other times it could be stories that people make up, but there's acknowledging that story. And what they did then is they worked with the stakeholders most affected by the behavior and asked those stakeholders to provide one or two recommendations that this gentleman could implement to change that behavior, really grow. And this gentleman worked on it for a year with his coach. And once a month, he would go back to those stakeholders and say, hey, remember that goal that, that I set and shared with you? Remember those recommendations you had? Remember that meeting that I was just in? How's the goal going? And based on that meeting, how do you think I'm doing with that action plan? So for a year, he's going back working on this, just working on these little recommendations that they had implemented day to day. Well, let me tell you what happened at the end of the year. There were two women who had refused to be part of this process and supporting him. They did not want to give advice. They were just terrified to work with him. And at the end of the year, his behavior and the perceptions around him were so drastically different. They were literally begging to be on his team. So I I use that story to say, yes, it's possible to deal with people's perceptions. Yes, you have to be humble. You have to work hard. You have to acknowledge. And it's really important to pull in the people around you who are affected by this to allow them to be part of your success. If you can do all of those, you can move forward. And, and the businesses can move forward as well. So can you give me some real life examples of negative stories that people might have going on about themselves in the workplace that you might want to change? And I know this is going to be different from everyone, but I feel like the more specific we can get, the more it, it jogs our memories to be thinking about um, our own situations in the workplace. Yeah, uh, there's a couple that come to mind pretty readily. That he or she is too nice, he or she is too bossy, contributing too much. Uh, they they offer too much. They have too much impact input on team ideas. It drags the team down or slows them down. It could be that somebody is overly controlling. It could be that somebody doesn't handle conflict well, uh, whether they're passive or overly aggressive. It could be that they're bad at delegating, and it could just be that somebody is not a good boss. Uh, Somebody, for example, might get promoted or hired into a role, and other people on the team wanted it. They don't like it. They craft their own story around that as to why that person shouldn't have the role. And that person goes in and then gets to deal with the perception problem and has to really earn that trust. Mm. So really, anything dealing with behavior can come out and present itself as an opportunity to craft a new story. Okay. So what I heard you say then are the routine or the, the steps to manage a, a story that you want to change about yourself in the workplace is to, first of all, get real with yourself. Acknowledge that the story is there and acknowledge that you're going to be humble about it and that you want to change it. And then you approach the people. How many people would you say is a good idea? And I guess it depends on how many people it's affecting, but. You're right that it it depends on how many people it's affecting. For a small business owner who only has one employee, that can be very difficult. For larger businesses like Fortune 500 companies, we may have as many as 10 to 18 stakeholders who are affected by this behavior. So if there were 10 to 18. Pretty wide. Yeah. Would you go to all of them? To, to do this process or would you just choose a handful of them that you felt it was most important to change? You know, I, I would actually go to all of them and let's run through those steps again because I think it's really important. Right. Uh, so there's this 
acknowledging what's going on. And part of acknowledging is, is acknowledging to the people who are affected by the behavior so that they have an awareness created that something is going on. You ask them for one or two ideas on how you can do better with that behavior. So that's the second step. You're acknowledging, then you're asking in response to the, what we call feed forward, the forward recommendations. All you need to say to these people is two words, thank you. You don't want to tell them, oh, that's the best idea. You don't want to roll your eyes. You just say thank you because you're going to take all of this feed forward and think about it. Think about which ones, which steps are the best ones to implement day to day. Just because you don't act on somebody's idea immediately doesn't mean it couldn't happen in the future. So that's why you don't want people to have the mindset of, oh, they're going to act immediately on what I have to say. So you're okay. going to acknowledge, ask, thank, think about the plan, put one together, you're gonna to act on it, and you're gonna follow up. You're gonna continually go back to these people and follow up to see how they're doing and adjust that plan as necessary. Okay, so let's say my name's Donna and I am getting negative feedback that's through the grapevine. I can sort of feel this story that it feels like um, there's a story about me that I don't contribute very much because I'm kind of quiet and I, I don't put a lot out there. Well, I want to change that. So there's, there's five people on my team. So I go to all five of them and I say, I know that there's a perception that I don't contribute as much in these meetings as would be helpful. And I would really like to change that. And I would like your help and feedback in how this is going. So I'd like to check in with you every month and see if you feel like I'm improving in this area. Is that a typical conversation? Yeah, with the addition of that ask. So what are one to two things that you think I could do that would okay. help me really be demonstrating that I'm a contributor? And someone might say, hey, I just need you to respond to the emails that we're sending. Or they might say, you know, in meetings, if you could bring one or two ideas to the table in preparation for the topic. Or another person might say, you know, you're so quiet, I'm not sure if you're listening. If you could just verbally acknowledge what's going on. So you're going to go to all five of those people and get one to two ideas, come awesome. back, take the cream of the crop, and build it into your daily schedule, maybe even with a checklist. And cool. just make sure that every day you're working that plan. Once a month, you're going back to them saying, hey, remember that goal? On a scale of one to ten, how am I doing? And at first, they might say two. They might say one. And you might have to say, okay, do you remember in the meeting when I was doing X, Y, and Z? And they might say, oh, you're right. I didn't recognize that, but you are. You were doing that. Keep doing that. Or you might need to be a little more expressive or loud and vocal in saying, yes, I agree. It was so quiet we didn't hear. Uh, but you keep doing that month after month for a year. And that is how this process really works. What's amazing is when you look at typical employee development programs, there's a lot of people out there who, based on different studies, say that somewhere between 75 to 90% of them don't work. And there's as much as 14 billion being spent in the US on employee development programs. So 90% of that money is being spent on waste. And it's at the end of the year, people are saying, hey, this person didn't change, they went to this class. That's very, different from what this process does. This process stands out from everything else because 95% of people who are doing this, and they've looked at 11,000 managers who have done this, 95% of them have made measurable change at the end of the year. It works. Wow. Well, anytime you can say that you've got that high a percentage of effectiveness, you've got something to hold on to. And I think particularly it would work well because by engaging the people who have these stories about you, they then become key in recreating the story, rewriting the story in a different way. And they're guiding you with what they need to rewrite that story, but you're also guiding them with, hey, look, I, I did this and was that what you wanted? And so you say it, it definitely needs to be, you need to do this for an entire year or could you do it for six months or, you know, what do you really need to do I, to change a story? 
Yeah, I would do it for a year. And the reason that I would do it for a year is the following. I, I just want to use an analogy that January commitment to go to the gym that lasts about three months. And, it, you know, you tell your, your best friends, I'm a gym goer. And they kind of chuckle because they've seen this goal year after year. You have one slip up and everybody's like, oh, we knew it. We knew you weren't a gym goer. You may know that the habit is set for you. But earning people's trust, changing that perception, that is what takes a lot longer. And so I would, I would absolutely stick with it for a full year. If it sounds draining, I, will, I, I do want to give a little bit of encouragement with this. When you think about performance reviews and people giving you feedback at work, most people have a pretty negative association with it. It just feels yucky. It feels like everybody's harping on the past. A lot of times there aren't really great recommendations given moving forward. And it can be a really discouraging time for both the, the managers who don't enjoy doing them and for the employees. One of the things that I love about this is that it does acknowledge the past, which you need to do, but it gets focused on the future and moving forward. And it's not harping on the prior stories that happened in the past. It's about efforts that are being made moving forward. And the analogy that I give is it's kind of like driving a car. How much of the time do you spend looking in the rear view mirror? Maybe two to 5% of the time, right? Mm -hmm. So it's important to acknowledge what's happened in the past. But if you're trying to drive down the road, staring at that past story, you're never going to get over it. You got to put your eye on the road and look to your future. And you look at the signposts coming up. You're taking it step by step. You're moving forward step by step. People who have gone through this experience will acknowledge that while it is hard and humbling to go to people and ask for help, they'll also say it's really positive because instead of talking with people about a past story, what they're going to people with is, what are one or two ideas that I can do moving forward? And they get to talk about the successes and the efforts they've made at the end of each month. And again, focus people on moving forward. It's really becomes about a positive experience and moving forward. I love, love, love that. That's awesome. I love the process. I, I love the fact that it's positive. I love the fact that it's about change in all the good ways. Oh, thank you, Emily. Thanks for sharing this with us. It's a, it's a, a key, and especially in, in the professional world, this is something that everybody has to deal with. You know, we're always creating stories about each other, and they're not always positive. And if there's one that's really heavy that's holding you back from a promotion or from getting along with the team or having people want to work with you, it's fantastic that there's a tool to actually help you do change those stories in a positive way. So thank you. You're welcome. Do you have any closing thoughts that you want to leave with us about how you've used story or about managing stories? Yeah, you know, I, I think what I would say is um, <clears throat> almost everybody I know has dealt with a story at one time or another that is really difficult. And those stories can be like weights on, the, on our back. And I would just say that there are ways to move forward with that. Uh, if you feel like you don't have people who can give you good recommendations, find people who will give you good recommendations. Don't do this alone. Uh, you, can, you can create stakeholders by looking around at the people who are successful and saying, hey, successful person, you don't know me super well, but what are the one or two things that you recommend for me to be a better communicator or to be a better manager? And most people are willing to step in and provide that type of mentorship. Especially if you're saying, can I, can I check in with you for just two or three minutes every month? People are willing to give you the time. Uh, so don't, don't go this alone. You don't have to do that. So that's, that's one. Number two, I just want to encourage you that it is never too late. It's never too late to create a new story. I'm, I'm a firm believer in that. I'll, I'll be honest. There's times when I'm working with my clients that I hang up the phone and I have a little bit of a dance party. I'm <laughs> it's probably bad to acknowledge on a, on a podcast, but I'm, I'm acknowledging it. I am so thrilled for these people. 
And, you know, sometimes they're coming to some really tough realizations about themselves and realizing, wow, that perception issue goes back to some truth, but they are willing to take it on. And I watch people again and again, become a better version of themselves. I will never forget one of the managers, one of my first coaching clients, actually, who turned to me and said, you know, Emily, I'm not just a better manager. I'm a better husband and I'm a better father. Mm. And it's, it is possible. It is possible to do this. Uh, it takes humility. It takes hard work. It takes diligence. But I truly believe in the strength of the human spirit. I really believe and have seen people make incredible changes. And it doesn't mean that they're 18 or 12 making those changes. They can be adults just like you, just like me. Uh, but there, there is hope. There are ways to do this. And so much of it is, is just right there in people's hands if they're willing to make the effort. So if people want to get a hold of you to hire you or talk shop or um, hear more on this topic, what's the best way they can reach you? I would send them to my website. It's Propels Coaching. Uh, Propels is plural. Propelscoaching.com. There's a contact me page there. That'll go right to my email address. We can set up you know, 15, 20 minutes to sit down and talk. If you've got questions, I'm happy to answer them. Okay. And I'm going to have all of her contact information in the show notes on the website under her episodes. So it will be easy to contact her. Thanks for being with us today, Emily. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. There are a hundred quotes about how we shouldn't care about what others think of us. And in many cases, that is spot on. But in the business world, where it's important that we are able to work with people of all different types, perspectives, and roles, and in a space where leaders are often learning just as those they lead are learning and growing also, it's not uncommon to have created or contributed to a story about us in the workplace and how we function that gets in our way of successfully connecting with others. When this is the case, managing those stories can be the key. If you found this interview insightful and know of someone in your sphere of influence who would appreciate it, pass it along. Share the love with your business associates because it creates relationships and possibility when we share our resources with each other. Have a great week creating stories that work for you and don't forget the Love Your Story podcast website where you can sign up for the 21-day challenge. Yay! The smorgasbord of story tools that you get to test out one every day. It's a great Christmas gift for yourself or for someone you want to give it to. And we also have the Love Your Story t-shirts available on the site and our free audiobook, our gift to you, Key to Your Super Self, How Your Stories Unlock Your Power. Download it from the website and we'll see you next week. <laughs>